Hey there. So uh, I'm Josh Adams from Elixir Sips and I Stop 11. And I'm Robbie Clements, and I've watched uh, Elixir Sips, and I'm from Center Source in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, we're going to talk today about building a visual programming language. Um, for in this case, it's for building chatbots. In a more general sense, it's about building uh, a business rules engine. So we chose to do it in the domain of chatbots because it's an easy domain to get your head around, and it has not a lot of complexity. Um, giving talks is always a little bit stressful, so um, we found it useful to do breathing exercises. So we wanted to start out by sharing some that we found helpful, and I promise this is not, this is not a soft talk. We don't do that. There's lots of code. Um, just bear with us. So just, just go ahead and just clear your mind and try to repeat the exercise you see on the slides. So first, just, just breathe in and out really deeply for a bit. And then try to breathe just a bit, a bit more rapidly. And then finally, just exhale as hard as you possibly can. And so now you've achieved Zen, and you're ready for a talk. Okay, dope. So the structure of our talk closely resembles the structure of our project. So uh, the concept is being able to change runtime behavior of your system through a visual programming language. Uh, generally, these are called business rules engines or production systems. The AST and its representation, this is a description of the types of programs we support building with this particular language. Um, the compiler, which turns an AST into a function. There's the front end, which is an Angular JS based browser application that lets you review and modify rules and store them in the back end. There's the API, which is the component that allows storing and modifying the rules. And it inter interfaces with the system that ultimately these uh, rules are being run against. And then there's the demo, where you decide to ask for our autographs. OK, so to start things off, um, we'll just discuss the, um, this at a high level concept. Um, at a high level, it's just a business rules engine. Um, so why do people use a business rules engine? Well, typically, the idea is that your application is one relatively static concept. And uh, there's some configuration that can be fiddled with to make it behave differently. This configuration is the business logic. Um, this way, the application doesn't need to be changed or redeployed just to support tweaks to the business logic. Um, and this helps support the core idea that uh, things that change at different paces, you know, they should be separate things. So like business logic, uh, it should cover a bunch of things, like the percentage of sales tax to charge based on the location of a, pur of a purchase, um, additional questions necessary to gather more information to make uh, better decisions later on in an application, and suggestions of classification of a given domain entity based on some of its attributes. So an, an example of this, this one is uh, we're doing a project where our client needs to categorize doctor visits and support ICD-10 medical coding. Um, based on the information they know about the doctor visit. So sometimes the person that's writing the rule knows that, in this case, if we had like these other two questions answered, we would know enough information to make a suggestion. So uh, they can write a rule that says, OK, if this is the case, then return a couple of questions we need asked. Uh, in other cases, they might know everything, but there's two or three suggestions that they can make. And so they might want to build a rule that says, OK, in this case, I you know, I know to, to code it this way. And over, the, over time, business analysts can categorize more and more visits correctly. So without changing the application, the 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 application gets better, right? So, so what is a visual programming language? So here's a screenshot of Scratch. Uh, this is a program built in Scratch. Uh, Scratch is easily the most popular visual programming language. I'm sure most people think of it when someone says this. Uh, kids use this to make games uh, without knowing how to program, except for it really is knowing how to program, right? This is a good way to learn it. Um, here's an example of a rules engine built in exactly the style that, that we're working on that's a bit further along. So it's not quite as pretty as Scratch yet, uh, and you can't really see it so easily on this screen with that washout. But uh, this is the spiritual successor to the Angular app that we're showing in this talk, and sort of the conceptual successor to the, to the Elixir piece. So one category of rules engines involves non-programmers changing the runtime behavior of the system. Well, we built a custom visual programming language that allows you to build out the chatbots easily and uh, modify their behavior at runtime without knowing how to program. So, it's also impossible to construct a program with our, without uh, syntax errors in our program, which is a nice additional feature. So to support this, uh, we define a custom AST that represents the rules, where rules are really just tiny programs. Uh, they either return something or they don't. OK, so um, we've mentioned the word AST a couple of times already. And you know, when I talk about this with people, sometimes they ask me, you know, what is that? So like all good programmers, you might go to Google to find out. So uh, Google's great. Let's just click on that first result here. Yep. All right, so AST stands for aspartate aminotransferase, no, uh, gonna... which is, um, <laughs> right. So I think this is wrong. Try, so try we'll, we'll again. try again. Maybe it's the second result. OK, so it's an abstract syntax tree. 
So this makes more sense, right? So here we have a tree that represents a program. You can't see my pretty lines so well. Uh, that represents the structure of a program in an orderly fashion. So uh, this might be the result of parsing uh, a text-based language, right? In our case, since we're a, a visual programming language, you're just actually directly manipulating the AST of the program uh, when you're building your rules. So here's an example that says, if the variable input contains the string table flip, then evaluate a response expression with the input, awesome guy flipping a table out of joy. Um, anyway, so to actually run these rules, uh, we go through a few transformation steps, which isn't that surprising since that's all that programming really is, right? Transforming inputs and outputs. So in our case, our input at the, at the beginning is uh, some JSON that is a slightly more verbose version of our idealized AST. And then we transform that into our AST. Then we transform that AST into Elixir's uh, AST, or quoted forms. And finally, we compile that into functions that are ultimately run in processes by a, a further part of the system. So here's the end goal. So editing a program in the browser um, in a tactile way. So this AST is just a thing that, that checks for that rule we talked about earlier. Uh, this is a very tiny programming language, but the core idea is solid and, and can be expanded upon. So let's talk about how it works at runtime. At runtime, we have a process that represents a, a collection of rules, and it sends a message every time a document is evaluated against the rule set. And it returns all the responses that its rules returned. So during runtime, those rules can be changed, and when that happens, we just swap out the process's state that's holding the list of rules for that, for that chatbot. All right, so now that you understand how this works holistically, let's get into the details. We're gonna look at the AST and its representation. So this is really comprised of two parts. Our language is idealized AST and the JSON representation. So we have to have both parts because we're choosing to transmit the AST by JSON. So if we use something like BERT or transit or protocol buffers to, trans, uh, to transfer the AST, we could conceivably avoid the second part, um, the second representation, but we didn't, so. Okay, so here are the type specs for our AST. Essentially, an expression is a two-tuple uh, where the first element is the type of an expression, uh, and the second element is the list of arguments. And these are the expression types that we support. So we have an if statement or an if else statement, and it works just like you'd think. The first argument is just used as a conditional, uh, and the second is the then branch. So th and then the third, if there is one, is the else branch. Uh, then we have a var, and it can fetch a variable out of the execution context. We put the message the rules are run against into the input variable. So far, this is the only valid variable that we have right now. Um, and then we have the contains. Uh, it just returns a Boolean that says whether or not the first argument uh, con contains the second argument. So, um, and then the response just builds a response struct, which is defined in our code. Um, right now, this is all that our language defines. It would be really easy uh, to add more, you know, general or special features, you know, as we wanted to. Um, but as we mentioned, our AST, it, it can't uh, be represented natively in JSON. Um, among other things, there are no atoms or tuples in JSON, uh, and consequently, we define a representation of it that is JSON compatible. So here is how our AST uh, comes from the front end in the JSON representation. And then we have a function called convert that takes in a string representing the JSON and it outputs a two-tuple representing our AST. And here you can see the input and the output to the function uh, for an example. And here's the implementation. So it all fits on one slide. Uh, basically we pattern match against different potential inputs uh, and then we return our idealized AST representation of the input. Okay, so um, now we have our AST. So the next thing is to transform it into valid Elixir quoted forms. So ultimately you might consider compiling this into modules if you actually have a system that needs to go fast. Uh, it's a lot faster than interpreting quoted forms, uh, you might expect. But for our use cases in this demo, the, this is plenty fast, so we're not doing that. Um, the transform is a module that takes in our ideal AST and outputs an Elixir AST. So we'll look at an example and it's not the easiest thing to read there, but that's our, uh, our table flip quoted form, our AST on the left. And then on the right, there's the Elixir quoted form that would represent sort of the program that that AST represents. And, you know, we have a test that just verifies that that works. Um, anyway, so here's the implementation, uh, very similar to, to what you saw before, except for this time we're using like unquote unquote. So we're just pattern matching on the expression type, and we're using uh, quote and unquote to build out our quoted forms. Uh, this is obviously recursive, so for each argument in each expression, we generate Elixir for it until we get to the leaf nodes and don't have to do it anymore. 
Um, and then here's the implementation for var response true, false binaries and contains. So basically this is two slides to, to show everything that that consists of. It's not very complicated code. Okay, so now we have our Elixir quoted forms and we want to evaluate those against our input string. So the compiler is a tiny, tiny module that just returns a function that takes an input and returns the rules output given that input. So uh, it receives our AST as its input and then it returns a function that evaluates the quoted forms that the transformer generates for the AST and it binds the input variable into its context so that we can get that, that var out. Um, so we'll see what that looks like. And again, this is super tiny. So on the top left, we just have a test that takes that JSON table flip AST, compiles it down, and then asserts that we have a function that operates like we wanted it to. Um, and then on the right, you can see the actual implementation, which is literally just generate the quoted forms, call eval quoted on them, and then return uh, the response. So that's the core of like the pure functional part of the system. Um, next, we have a chatbot gen server. So this is an abstraction around a list of rules. Uh, in our current implementation, we aren't threading any state through this, so it's not technically necessary for us to have a gen server here. Um, but this would be the place that if you were building a rule that built up state, or if you were building a system that built up state uh, as the rules were evaluated, this would be the place you would do it. Um, so a chatbot just consists of a name and a list of rules, and they run in their own processes. So uh, they handle evaluating a given input against their list of rules and collecting the results to return them. And here's the type for a, a gen server state. Uh, as I mentioned, it's just a name and a list of rules. A rule can be one of two things. It's either a module name that has an apply function, uh, which takes a message and returns a response, or it's just a function that takes a message and returns a response. Uh, and this was just basically for some prototyping I was, do uh, I was doing. It could be just one or the other. Um, I had some fun with this type spec because I'm pretty sure this is the first time I did a type spec that um, spec an anonymous function based on its uh, input and, and output uh, types. Anyway, and this is the public API for evaluating message. So uh, this also includes the gen service handle call for that case. Um, there's something kind of clever happening here. Um, and I want to point it out, I don't know how clever it is, but I, I enjoyed it the first time I sort of came up with doing it this way. Uh, anyway, so this, this is the first case where like protocols made me super happy. Um, there are other ways that we could do this thing, but this makes me happy. Um, so you can see here that we're calling the apply function for each of the chatbot rules, and we're doing that inside of a for comprehension. So um, applying the rule is done differently depending on whether it was a module or a function, but that, that's not really important. But the into key says that for our for comprehension, we're going to take the, you know, the response of the for comprehension and put it into the chatbot DSL response. Um, and so we do that with the collectible protocol. And so I just wanted to show um, the implementation of that for response. So here's what the response structs type looks like. Uh, it has a from string, and we're using this to fill it with the chatbot's name. Uh, and then there's a list of messages. And so this is super easy. So let's look at the implementation of the collectible protocol. So first things first, at the bottom of uh, the actual structs file, I defined the collectible implementation. And here, collectible, all it needs is an into function to be defined. And so I just delegate it to the, the response module, like the module this is for. Um, I've enjoyed doing, doing it that way. I, I played with like putting the implementation in the, the def impl here. Uh, I, you may not prefer just doing a delegate, but I enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, then let's look at the implementation of the into function, because that's the important part. So it looks like a big function, but that's just because there's lots of comments. Uh, so we'll walk through the bits that matter. So here, and is that, is that readable? I think it is, uh, but I'm not back there. So basically, um, in the event that we return a nil in the inside of the for comprehension, uh, then we just basically don't do anything with it. We don't collect it into the response. Um, this, this acts like a filter, uh, you know, not a filter of what you're comprehending across, but a filter on responses. Uh, and this is just nice because this is the place that the nils go away. So in Ruby, if I were doing something like this, I might like have a big like array and it might have some nils in it and I might uh, like call compact on it. And then later on, I might have someplace else that I hadn't called compact on it. So I might just litter compact throughout my code because that's how you solve the problem. Uh, but this is the only place this can happen. So uh, I, never, I never will have to worry about nils past this point. Um, anyway, so I don't know, this makes me happy a little bit. It's a tiny filter, but it's, it's fun to do it here. Uh, anyway, enough of that. So if we're collecting a message, uh, we put it into the list of messages. So this is sort of the field in the struct. Uh, this is where in some more interesting rules engines, you might collect different types of return values uh, into different fields in your struct. So maybe you're building a, a more comprehensive response uh, type. And so maybe depending on the return value, you put it into different positions in the structure that you're returning. Um, Anyway, in the medical coding engine, for instance, uh, we might return additional questions. Those would go somewhere. We might return guidances. They might go somewhere else. Uh, we might return ICD-10 codes. 
So here, they're all just messages, so we just collect them in the one spot. Um, anyway, so you also could imagine that maybe we have, since this is a chatbot thing, maybe we want to implement something that has some state. So like maybe you're incrementing a counter based on giving kudos to a person in the room. Um, and so that would just be a response type, and then the, the server would handle uh, doing something with that response type. <laughs> and that would just be in a different field, I would assume. Anyway, so this is the next bit of the collectible protocol. This is basically, uh, we're done. So here we're just returning the, the, the source now that we've collected stuff into it. Uh, you might use this for like doing some cleanup before you actually returned. Um, I haven't found a case where I needed to do that, but it seems, seems fair like if you're collecting across something that has some, uh, some open port or something. Um, and then you also have to handle the case with the collectible halts. I also haven't had to deal with this ever, but figured I'd show it for completeness sake so you can actually implement this. Um, anyway, so that's that. All right, so now we have the ability to turn our AST into functions that do whatever we want. Um, and and we, now we need to make it easy to build out various ASTs and ultimately store them in a persistent store. Um, right now, we're just going to talk about the front end for a minute. Um, so we built our front end uh, in Angular. Uh, it communicates with our Elixir API. Uh, and it consists of two parts. Um, the first part just allows you to visually manage your AST elements. And then the second part allows you to create you know, multiple chatbots and, uh, and each chatbot having a list of uh, rules that it adheres to that consist of our AST. Um, and so this is where it all begins right here. Um, this is our AST builder HTML view. Uh, one of the cool parts about building this in Angular, if you guys have never used it before, um, is directives. These are just markers that you can place on a DOM element and they tell Angular's HTML compiler uh, to attach a specified behavior to that DOM element. So you can see on line three, we're uh, just calling our AST element directive that's defined in our AST builder controller. Uh, and here is where that is defined. Uh, in the controller, we have this directive called AST element, and uh, it has a template specified on line 47, uh, and it will render that template if it's ever called. And it also has a create block function on line 50 that expects a type uh, that sets our scope's AST based on the type that it receives. So this is how you can turn a placeholder element into an expression of a given type. For instance, if it's past the string if, it sets our uh, AST to contain the, the string if with empty arguments. And then if it's past the string contains, it sets the AST with the type contains and arguments that specify a type of var. Uh, that should be an input and a type of string uh, that contains a static string as its arguments. And then lastly, if it's past the string response, it just sets AST with a type of response that has arguments of a static response string. Um, so also our AST element directive has a function that checks our AST. And if it's empty, then this is going to return true. And if it does, then our AST element template gets rendered. Uh, this is specified in the directive that I just showed you. Um, so Everything inside of the NGF on line two will be rendered. Angular's NGF directive, uh, it just removes or recreates a portion of the DOM tree based on an expression. So if you notice, we're calling uh, that function AST is empty. So since our NGF returns true, we render a drop down menu with a button that calls our create block function. And that passes the expression you choose based on the selected value from the menu. So next on line 13, you can see we're calling another function named AST is if. So back in our directive, we have that very function. It checks our AST again, and it's just checking it this time for the string if. And if it returns true, our, this, our directive is called, and it renders its uh, template that's defined on line 35. And then here's that template. So if you'll notice on line four, it's calling the AST element directive that we initially called to start this process. So this is where like, the nesting of the AST elements begin, but we had an issue with Angular because Angular doesn't allow um, directives to recursively call themselves. So we had to add a library called Angular Recursion, I think, um, and that had the functionality that we needed for this to work. Um, so back in our AST element template on line 16, we're calling the function uh, AST contains, and our AST is contains. And it, uh, it, if it returns true, it renders its template. Um, so by now, you probably noticed that we're just using the directives to pattern match based on what type of expression that this AST node represents. Um, same thing with our uh, AST contains function. 
Uh, if it returns true, this is the, the directive that will actually be called. The difference between this one is it's actually like setting the AST and the scope based on what input that the user inputs um, and just enters that into our AST. And just for good measure, our AST contains template that's rendered. Um, all right, so I'm going to go back to our AST element template. Uh, we move on to line 16. We're calling the uh, AST as response. And if it returns true, then that, this directive is called. You, you see what's going on here. Um, and it, here's its response function, just checking for the AST for the string response. And then this is uh, its directive that gets called. And then this one, just, just like the other one, sets the AST based on what input uh, that the user enters. And then finally, our AST response template. So I want to go back uh, here one more time just to like reiterate on what's happening. This is our AST element template. Uh, we're using the directives names like AST empty, AST if, AST contains, and AST response to pattern match based on the NGF before each directive. So it will render its uh, template based on the type of expression that the AST node represents. And the AST if directive just calls the original AST element to keep nesting uh, and doing our pattern matching process. So the second part of the front end is pretty simple. It's just the CRUD interface that allows us to you know, create our chatbots and it interacts with the, uh, the Elixir API. It's just basic CRUD implementation. But I think it's important just because it's the segue into the next section of our talk. Um, you can just see we're making calls to the API to manage chatbots. And then the same thing here, just to create rules uh, for the chatbots. So after talking uh, about all these uh, calls to the API, let's have Josh talk about the API. So uh, that's the front end. It interacts with the API. Our main rules engine uh, that we talked about initially is a separate OTP application. And our API is just a small Phoenix application that interacts with our our rules engine application. Um, this is our database-oriented representation of a chatbot. It's basically the same as, as you saw in the OTP app. Uh, as you can see, it's just a name and list of rules. Uh, every time a new one is added or the details change, we restart the gen server associated with this chatbot. Um, here's the model we use to store rules in the database. Uh, they have an AST field where they can store the AST for the rule, and they belong to a given chatbot, so nothing, nothing too fancy. Here are routes. This is all very basic Phoenix and Ecto stuff. Uh, just some nested routes in an API pipeline. So we have a chatbots resource managed by a chatbot controller. Underneath it is nested a rules resource managed by a rules controller, rule controller. Uh, anyway, um, I'm pretty happy with the integration test for, for the API. Uh, I used a method I learned from a blog post by Dan Swain. Um, and basically, this is just a support library that can interact with our API using an HTTP client during our tests. And then writing our integration test becomes very easy. So this thing encodes our request on the way out. So we give it a map or, or a struct. It turns into JSON. It gets decoded on the way in. And that way, we can easily specify the endpoint and anything we want to post to it. Um, here, I'm just testing the status code of responses. So this is making sure that we can create chatbots in our API. Um, and it's very, very easy to write this test, right? Uh, we also make sure that when we try to make a chatbot with an empty name, it's rejected. Similarly, for the rules endpoints, so in our setup, uh, I use the API to create a chatbot. I fetch its ID out of the response. And then we post the rules endpoint to create new rules on that chatbot. And we make sure we can't create an empty rule and that we can update a rule. And so our conceptual model says that we're going to be replying to chats. But our rules engine doesn't need to know anything about how that happens. Um, right? We're just responding with, with messages from our rules, but they don't need to do anything at that point. So consequently, we have the XMPP bits living in the API project. And so Hedwig is an XMPP client that Sonny Scroggin wrote. And we're using it to connect to an XMPP server when we start our API up. And all the messages that get returned from rules get relayed to this handler module. And this is sort of how you can build uh, bots with, with Hedwig. And so when we see a message, we turn it into the message struct that our rule evaluator knows how to deal with. Uh, then we use a function on the chatbot from the OTP app called scattergather. Uh, we send it out serially to each running chatbot gen server. Um, and then we loop through all the responses that came back, and we call handle response on them. So um, the chatbots, the way that Scattergather works is the chatbots in their init for the gen server, they register themselves with PG2 uh, into a group named chatbots. And then Scattergather just gets the list of PIDs and asks them serially to evaluate the messages. Handle response just sends the responses message back to the XMPP server, and it prefixes it with the name of the chatbot that the response is from. And this is primarily because I only actually have one chatbot connected. Um, otherwise, you would just use its nick, right? And in the API's model for the chatbot, we define how to start the uh, chatbot DSLs gen servers for chatbots. So 
We define this ensure started function. Um, it takes a chatbot model. If one's running, uh, if a gen server for that model is running, it stops it, it starts a new one, and then it registers with a name so that later we can find it to kill it again. Um, we could just replace its state, but here we're actually killing it. Uh, and so anyway, we call this function from the controllers whenever a chatbot or whenever its rules are updated. And anyway, so now we have a demo, and I need to, let me see, I'll actually run it up there rather than mirror my screen, but I can figure out how to. No, I don't. Magic. Bull honking. Oh, here we go. There we go. Oh, come on, really? I believe in magic. It's okay. All right, fine. <laughs> I will do this. You can't beat me. Um, I don't think you can beat me. Hold on a second, that's what I needed. Okay, doke, here we go. So here, if I can find my mouse, maybe I should have mirrored the screen. I know, it's huge. Okay, doke, so here is a list of our chatbots. We create these two when we start the app, so like there, it's seeds basically. And so you can go and look, and this guy has the table flip rule. So if we look at his AST, where is it? Uh, he doesn't have any rules. This guy has rules. Why didn't the other guy have a rule? Wait a second here. Okay, there we go. So here's this rule. Um, it's really hard to read it. So this is basically responsive design in action. Okay, here's my input. <laughs> so if the input contains table flip, then he responds with this guy, right? Uh, let me go ahead with that. Um, sorry. Okay, so that's that rule. And let's see it in action, right? So uh, I've got here, I have a Jabber client that is connected to this thing, and so I can say things. First off, I've got one uh, that sort of runs all the time, and he's just an uppercaser. So that gets upcased. Uh, if I can say table flip, right? And that happens, so that's good. And then we've got another guy who's really macabre. Um, so anyway, but let's, let's actually go and add a rule. So we're going to add a new chat bot for this. Oh, hold on, I have to type in here. Okay, so this is the cop. So we have a new chat bot down here called cop. We're gonna make a new rule. And we're gonna say if the input contains something, then we're gonna respond with something. And I know this is a very basic uh, sort of language, but it is, it is very flexible. We've got a, a much more complicated thing. So let me come in here and find my presenter notes, which are totally not showing up. That's fantastic. Oh, no, momento. This is super important that I get this right. Because he, it's not that important. Bear with me. Computers, how do they work? Okay, doke. All right, there you go. I believe in miracles. Okay, doke. So we're making this rule. So we're saying, all right, if the input contains now, one thing that's worth pointing out because somebody's going to wonder this immediately: the bots don't respond to each other. To each other. So I'm not going to. We, get we it thought done. about doing that, but then it just infinitely loop. It would be possibly. It'd be pretty boring anyway. So if if uh, if somebody flips a table in this room, though, the cop's responsibility is to uh, fix it. Oh, that's wrong. Hold on a second. Got to get rid of that extra stuff. Yeah. So that's his responsibility. So we'll save it, and we haven't restarted anything, right? We come over here, and let's go ahead and flip a table. Yeah, all right. So that's a live demo of editing rules. Uh, obviously, this is just chatbots, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's honestly super flexible. So let us go back to presenting here. Okay, so... Um, does anybody have any questions about, about this? Finally, uh, again, I'm Josh from mystop11.com and from Elixir Sips, and there's my GitHub. I'm Robbie from Center Source. I think that's it, guys. Okay. Thank you.